The last time we talked about Ezekiel's vision, and uh, today we're going to try to cover chapters 4 through 32, so those middle two sections, the oracles against God's people and the oracles against other nations. <laughs> I know, it's a lot. Uh, so if you can click one more, this is basically what we're going to be covering. I'm going to start off a little bit with three, and then I'm going to uh, go 4 through 32. Now, I've done a lot of prep and study for this time because there's a lot to cover, uh, so hopefully we can get through it all. So, uh, and then the last two weeks, we're going to break up. Actually, there's just so much good stuff in that last section that we're going to take two weeks to cover that. But that's what we're covering today. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so today, is, as the, the, the chapter said, it's all about the oracles. Okay. The oracles of judgment. And that word oracle is pretty interesting because... Uh, the Hebrew there, I've got it up there just because it's, I think it's fun. It's Masa. You want to say Masa? Masa. There you go. Now you're a prophet. Uh, so that's kind of the word that was used to describe when a prophet would receive a message. And this is what he had to bring. He had to bring the oracle. Now, if you click one more, you'll see kind of the other definition of this word. Not only does it mean oracle, but it means burden. And this is very intentional because very often... The message that a prophet had to bring was not always uh, a thing that people wanted to hear. Um, in fact, it was pretty much like the burden that they had to carry and bear as they brought it to the people. So they were bearing this burden of this difficult message that they had to share. And that's all throughout all the prophets, that whenever they see an oracle concerning yada yada, an oracle concerning so-and-so, this is what they were talking about they knew that okay this is not only just a message but it's also a burden to carry and it was always a burden to carry that was felt first by the prophet and not just the people that were receiving it but the prophet especially had to carry this burden of the oracle and so kind of unpacking this idea you can go one more this is kind of like the the summary statement of this whole, this whole section that um, bearing God's word inevitably means bearing bad news and hard truths, bad news and hard truths. Uh, Cause that's basically all you see throughout um, this whole, this whole time is that it means bearing bad news and hard truths. Uh, so moving on to the next slide. Here's kind of the first big point that we see, and this is really the point that we see with chapter three and then a lot of that big section of oracles against God's people, that God is the one who changes hearts, so just stick to the script, scripture. Yeah, did you like that? I came up with that. Uh, so God is the one that changes hearts, so just stick to the script. So really with chapter three and kind of what God tells Ezekiel that he should do, if we go to the next slide, Click one more. So in chapter three, verse 17. Now we've, we just talked about when God was giving Ezekiel his instructions. Now he's kind of wrapping it up. He says, son of man, I've made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. Take what I give you and then give it. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And that was what Ezekiel had to do. He knew exactly what to say from God. And then he knew exactly what to say to the people. Wouldn't it be nice if it always worked like that? Especially when you have to give someone some, some hard truths. Uh, and I just want to say too, as we're going throughout this, maybe you have a situation or someone in your life, maybe it's kind of a new thing, maybe it's an ongoing thing, that you know you have to speak some hard truths to. And... Maybe that person is not super receptive to hearing you. I know we've all got at least someone. I, I'm actually thankful that I got to kind of think about this and study this right now because I have someone in my life that I'm going to have to have a really difficult conversation with in a couple of weeks. Uh, and just to give some information, it's a friend of mine who is married and he's been making some really selfish actions. Uh, and he's not treating his wife well at all and she is you know she's a saint for for kind of putting up with it but he's kind of skirting his responsibility to his wife and he's really not 
wanting to be held accountable to what God wants for him. I love this friend of mine. Um, he also is not really kind of stepping up to the plate and leading spiritually. Um, he's kind of dragging behind. She's trying to push forward and it's just not good. And, uh, but I'm one of this guy's closest friends. I'm also a pastor. So if I'm not going to talk to him, who's going to talk to him? Uh, and my heart weighs heavy. This conversation I know has been coming for a while. Uh, but ultimately, I know that's a conversation that has to happen. And what's going to make it the most difficult is that I love my friend. And he's not going to want to hear me. He's not going to listen to me. I might, he might cut off ties with our friendship, just with kind of how direct I have to be. Um, I'm not looking forward to it. I'm also not someone who's very confrontational, just not, not really in my nature. But again, this is what I signed up for, to be a bearer of God's word, to be a bearer of the hard truths. And I know you guys all have situations in your life where you have to give someone the hard truth. And wouldn't it be nice if we just had God tell us exactly what to say and when to say it? Because that's what Ezekiel had. God not only told him what to say, he told him when to say it. That would be nice, but we don't get that. So we don't exactly get a script, but we do have the scriptures. And this is where we go, and this is where we turn to know, okay, what's God's best for this person? And how do I convey that to them, even though I know it's going to hurt? And the only person that's going to be hurt is not just them. That's going to be you, because you know they're not going to want to hear it. It's never fun really calling someone out. But that's what we're called to do. So I want you to have that person in mind because maybe you've got that going on right now. And hopefully this will give you some direction. Now, with this point, then, if you click one more, uh, God gives all these like scenarios. And here's just one example, okay? So he says, When I say to a wicked person, this is God. So when I say to a wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life. That person will die for their sins, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person, and they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways, they will die for their sin, but you will have saved yourself. Pretty heavy stuff. Uh, very heavy stuff. Now, here's a really interesting thing that I want you to notice, though. And this gets to the whole point of all of these oracles. Notice what I've highlighted in that bigger paragraph. In order to save their life. Now, what does God say, though? At the start of verse 18, you will surely die. That's a pretty harsh thing to hear from God and to be told from God that you will surely die for this. But what's the point of the warning? To save their life. Does God actually want them to perish? And to be their own worst enemy and to be sabotaging their life and the lives of people around them? No. God gives these warnings in order to save their life. And maybe you're not dealing with a situation as drastic as that, but you could be saving a relationship or a marriage or just saving someone from causing a whole bunch of trouble for themselves and others. Giving that bad news. This path is not God's best for you. What you're doing is hurting you and hurting everyone else. It's not what God wants for you. Now, whether they listen or don't listen, that's kind of the whole theme of Ezekiel, right? God pretty much tells them they might not listen. But it's funny, uh, earlier than this, uh, God says, you know what? I've been trying to speak to them and they haven't listened to me, but they, they might listen to you. That's what he tells Ezekiel. That, they've, that me, God, they haven't listened to me, but maybe they'll listen to you. That's a pretty interesting thing for God to say. But again, with Ezekiel being planted and having this shared experience of being in exile among the other exiles, there's kind of like a level of love and of commonality where Ezekiel can relate to their experience and he's with them in it. So it's not like he's removed, but he's right there. And I think that has something to do with the sort of the logic of, okay, God says they might not listen to me, but they might listen to you because you're right there. You're in their lives. And it's the same goes for you. You might be the best person 
to speak that hard truth to that person. You might be the best person. And it's not really anything any, any of us want to do, but again, what makes you qualify is that you, you love them. You love them. You don't want them to, to be hurting themselves or going through the difficulties. And you do everything you can to prevent the worst. That's what Ezekiel is dealing with. So quick one more. Uh, now, I just wanted kind of two quick sort of examples of what it means to be a watchman and giving a word of warning. So this first guy, Cyril Evans, does that name ring a bell for anybody? Clearly it's an old picture. He's uh, since passed. Um, but Cyril Evans, this is the guy that tried to call the Titanic to warn them that there might be icebergs ahead. And in fact, he did get through them. He was on his own ship by himself in the Atlantic. And he got on the radio and he was screaming so loudly, like, you are going to hit an iceberg. And the captains of the Titanic, they were trying to sort through all the private messages that were supposed to be sent out from all the you know, fancy people on, the, on board that they just didn't want anything to do with this warning. And why is this guy screaming in the phone? And they literally just said, okay, this guy's just way too much. And they, they put the radio away. Didn't he just warning? And what happened? Yeah. And we don't think about this guy. He's not the guy I remember, but we really think about the captain of the Titanic because he was warned and he didn't do anything about it. So Cyril, he did his job as a watchman. And did someone listen? No. That's unfortunate. Now, click to the next one. Dave Freeman. This is a guy I guarantee you don't know. Uh, but it's just a story I saw. I thought it was interesting. Um, this is a, a weatherman. You can tell by his headshot. He looks like a weatherman. Uh, and he's a weatherman in Kansas. No longer, but he was uh, several years ago. And he was a very faithful weatherman. So what do weathermen do? They warn about things happening. Do the things that they warn about always happen? No. They get paid whether they're right or wrong. Exactly, great job. They get paid whether they're right or wrong. I wish that was the same for me. But uh, so, but there's a weatherman and he knew that this tornado was coming and he really got it, uh, did all of his meteorologist stuff where he knew exactly where it was gonna be kind of falling. And he was giving these warnings and just staying on the air even longer than he needed to because he wanted to make sure that whoever was in the path of this tornado made sure that they were out of the way. And there was a couple watching, actually uh, a pastor of a church, and he saw that the, the tornado was going to come through and he might have um, just tuned in at the tail end of the broadcast where it normally wouldn't be the weather, but he was staying on longer. And uh, the minister said, oh my goodness, well, okay, then let's get down to the basement. And then when they saw that things were starting to get crazy, they went down to the basement. And when they came back up after the storm, everything was leveled in their house. Uh, but they got out without a scratch. And the pastor actually wrote a book about this, uh, just actually kind of tying in some of these things of giving the warning to what was going to happen. And, uh, and, and it's a pretty incredible story. Um, but there's an example of a watchman, again, just doing his job hoping that someone will actually listen, and it ended up saving some lives. But you see, these are both watchmen. They both did their job. For one, they were listened to. For the other, they weren't. And that's just kind of how it goes. That you could do everything right, and you could say all the things that you think need to be said. You can lead the horse to water, can't make him drink. Sometimes people listen, sometimes they don't. And man, isn't it hard when the people you love don't listen? It is one of the hardest things. That's where God calls us to be. That's where God calls us to be. Uh, and he doesn't leave us alone. Uh, moving on. It's a little bit like the parable of the sower, if you remember this. I think it's a great example. Jesus tells a parable about a farmer who goes to sow seed. So he's throwing seed all around. And Jesus describes different places where the seed lands, sometimes on the path, sometimes on the rocky soil. Um, and then, I don't remember the third one. And then in the good soil. Among the weeds, thank you. Thank you. Thousand points. Uh, among the weeds. So, and then on the good soil. And Jesus then is saying, well, and he actually 
one of the few times a parable is ever actually explained exactly what it means, which I wish Jesus did that with all the parables because sometimes they're very confusing. Um, but this is one where he actually explains what it means. And the sower, that is kind of the one who's bearing God's word. That's the one who is speaking God's word and, and, and telling the truth of God to others. And the truth then is the actual seed that they're throwing. And then the different kinds of soil, that's the different kinds of hearts that are hearing it and should be receiving it. And Jesus kind of tells us, okay, you kind of, I'm kind of giving you the truth and I'm calling you to speak it in love. But sometimes people might not listen. Okay, and if Jesus could go through his entire ministry as the son of God and still have pretty much everyone reject him, I think you can give yourself a little grace knowing that if that person is not listening to you, well, Jesus had that happen too. And Jesus had, at the end, really no one listened to him. And so if, don't be discouraged if you think, okay, that person, they're not listening, nothing's getting through. I can't explain why specifically that's happening, but at least know that Jesus encountered the exact same thing. He spoke the truth of God in love. He knew all the right words to say. People still did not listen. What a mystery. I can't say why this happens. Uh, but at least be encouraged that, you know what? Jesus wasn't able to convince everyone either. Um, now, if you move on to the next slide, I, I got to talk about this a little bit because it's just so crazy. Uh, so Ezekiel chapter four, turn there if you're not there. Um, so Ezekiel is pretty interesting because he has many what are called action prophecies or sign acts, okay? So here are two of them. And I'll just read, read this off. And that's a, basically a picture of what's going on. But it says, now, son of man, take a block of clay, put it in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it, erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set up camps against it, and put battering ramps around it. Then take an iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and turn your face toward it. It will be under siege, and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the people of Israel. <laughs> this is his first assignment, by the way. But clearly, Ezekiel started out in youth ministry because he's starting out with a good old object lesson. Uh, no. Uh, but that's kind of, a, I think, a good picture of what's going on here. He has to lay on his side and basically get out the Lego set and then get his little catapult and start laying siege to it. And this is going to be a sign for Israel, for the people that are around him. And I think, well, that's bizarre. Yes. And it gets funnier. Going to verse four, then lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the people of Israel. And after you finish this, lie down again, this time on your right side and bear the sin of the people of Judah. Remember, there are two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. They were split up. Uh, and I've assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. So he's got to lie on his side, on his left side, for 390 days for all the sins of Israel. And he's got to turn over and then lie on his right side for 40 days. I mean, I'm sure he was not expecting this at all to be what he was supposed to be. And you think, okay, why is he doing this? Well, for one, I mean, remember that they're exiles probably without much of belongings just camping out by a river um and that's where they had settled uh and probably didn't have very much so they're kind of making do with what they have um but really too as i kind of mentioned with object lessons sometimes those things stick in your head you can probably think of maybe an object lesson in church or some other kind of thing that we've done and those objects Kind of stick in your head with you know hopefully it's not just the object but the actual point sticks in your head too but clearly um, ezekiel's been doing this and okay 390 days on on his left side uh 40 days on his right he's doing this for a long time a lot of scholars think okay it's pretty unlikely that he just stayed there but he probably had a time every day where he was there and then that's when he would do a lot of his prophesying but i want you to just look at this picture 
my screen. I want you to look at this picture and take in how funny this is, how bizarre it is. Um, <clears throat> and now think about in your life, especially if you're dealing with someone that just doesn't seem to be listening, can't get through, uh, you're trying to speak the truth in love, nothing's going on. Now think about that person and now think about the lengths that you've gone to and the crazy things that you never really signed up for to try and convey your message. I'm sure you can think of something. Late nights, uh, crazy turns of events, things that you're like, what the heck? I, this, this is not in the normal job description. No, it's not. But sometimes God uses those weird, crazy times and puts you right in them, and he's going to work through them. It will be a sign to them. And they might not see it right away. But we pray that they would recognize that, okay, you're here and you're doing this crazy thing ultimately to save their life and to be the person that they need, the person who's with them, willing to do, kind of go above and beyond and do whatever is necessary to love them and kind of bring them back to God. That's really the big picture. But also, too, what I just thought about, um, okay, when, when the sanctuary is being built, there is this big old model of it, like an architect's model of it. I think they used to have it camped out in here. Yeah. Um, I saw when I came here in Bickers, I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then they explained why they got it. But it was kind of, you know, get people excited about the sanctuary coming up. But just to give you an idea of like what this would have been like, imagine if Pastor Tucker on a Sunday, the thing's over there. I don't know where it is, but it's right behind all that, all that stuff, I think. Imagine if you wheeled it out on the, in the church on Sunday, that, 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 uh, that model, and he laid down on his side, and he like, had siege works, little siege works that he was doing, uh, and he started like, trying to preach. Wouldn't that be just, just it, you wouldn't forget it. You would never forget it. It would get your attention. You would not be sleeping at all. Uh, and that's kind of the idea, too that there's no way you can kind of ignore what's going on here. Uh, and that's just kind of how God works sometimes. So I just thought that'd be funny. So you can ask Pastor Tucker to do that sometime. We, we all could. Uh, but like I said, God is the one who changes hearts. Not you. I know you want to. I know you want to. But you cannot. You cannot change hearts. You've got your job. Stick with the truth that you know. Love as best you can. And that's what you're called to do. But I love this, this uh, section of Ezekiel. It, it's one of the more famous passages of, of Scripture. It says, therefore say, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Because they said, are you going to just wipe us out completely? And this is how God responds. Although I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, Yet for a little while, I've been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. I therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered. I'll give you back the land of Israel again. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. And of course, this, this famous line, verse 19, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. Ezekiel, he doesn't tell Ezekiel to go and change their hearts. Who does he say is going to change their hearts? Himself. He is going to be the one to change their hearts. Remove the heart of stone and give a heart of flesh. And he's the one behind all of this crazy exile, uh, put into captivity stuff because he loves them. Sends them away, kind of in, well, puts them in time out for about 70 years uh, in order to bring them back. And in that time, giving them a heart of flesh. 
So it's God's, God's responsibility. All right, next slide, point two. Oops, oh, sorry, sorry, Mike. Uh, yes, there's Ezekiel chapter 11 in all its glory. Okay, now, next slide. Uh, click one more time. Okay, point two. God is fair in his justice, so don't say, uh-huh. Now, the reason for this point, well, point one, that's pretty much all of the oracles against God's people summed up. Everything you kind of need to know about the general gist, uh, the details are pretty interesting if you ever want to read it, um, but chapters uh, four through 24, those 20 chapters of oracles against God's people, that's pretty much summed up in, in, in point one. So point two, uh, if you click one more, that's kind of what the oracles against these other nations are. Okay, so God's, he's uh, given his people all the sort of the judgments, the hard news, uh, the bad news that they need to hear, but he's not quite done. Uh, because maybe just imagine, because I've been in this position, actually I'll mention this. Growing up, I have a brother and a lot of times, um, I would be the one causing trouble. And my brother was usually just roped into it. He was my younger brother. And my father would get wind of this somehow, some way, and would be talking to us. And uh, maybe sometimes if, if he saw my brother doing something, he would kind of start yelling at him and saying, why are you doing this? Don't do that. And I don't think I ever really did it, but I knew part of me was thinking, eh. <laughs> you know, that I wanted to basically say, wow, I got off scot-free. This is great. But my father, knowing better, would turn from my brother and turn to me then, and uh, probably knew that I was the one behind it all. And after he was done talking to my brother, I knew I was next. What's the point? I should know not to say, uh-huh, because as soon as dad was done with my brother, he was moving to me. Now, all these nations you should know, like all the nations that surrounded Israel, uh, they all saw this happening to Israel. And you know what they wanted to say? Uh-huh. Exactly. You know what they should not have said? It was, uh-huh, because God was done dealing with Israel, and now... It's the other nation's turn. And literally, it, he kind of says it like this, which is pretty great. Uh, Ezekiel, if you go to the next slide. So chapter 25, starting off the oracles against the other nations. It says, say to the Ammonites, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, uh-huh, over my sanctuary when it was profaned, and over the land of Israel when it was made desolate, and over the house of Judah when they went to exile. Therefore, behold, I am handing you over to the people of the east for possession. And they shall set their encampments among you and make their dwellings in your midst. Basically says, all right, well, I'm using Babylon to teach my kids a lesson. Uh, but you snot in those kids. You're not going to get off any easier because you're, you're just as bad. Uh, so God, again, is fair in his justice. Now, this is important for us to remember. Because if you've been person who might need to say a hard truth to someone maybe you've had the uh inclination to be a little kind of you know up on a pedestal uh, up on your high horse and you think well you think that you have never done anything worth uh, rebuking now would that be the wise thing and the wise way to approach that situation Absolutely not. We know that God is fair in his justice. So when we are called to bear those hard truths with people, we do it from a place where we have already borne that hard truth ourselves. A place from humility, a place of repentance of our own selves and our own shortcomings, where it's not me and God are up here and, you know, we're shining the light, good cop, bad cop on the person down here. But God's up here. And you and them are on the same level, eye to eye. 
That's the whole point of sending Ezekiel to say these things, because Ezekiel was no better, really, but God was going to use him. And this is actually talking about um, the structures of the books of the Bible and how the structure of this book has a logic to it. This is exactly what we see in Romans, how Romans starts out. I'll click the next slide and then click one more. So Romans starts out, if you're familiar, uh, it's all about them and they. Okay, they did this, they did that, they're terrible, they're sinful. Uh, and is that true? Yes, it's true. Um, for it says, although they knew God, talking about basically Gentiles, people, just every ordinary people, uh, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but in their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So here's St. Paul giving kind of the hard truth about all those people out there, you know, all them. And I'm sure the people reading the letter are like, yeah, yeah, you know what? All those sinners out there, Paul's on to something. Yeah, they, they need to listen up. Uh, and then Paul goes on. Uh, click again. He says, you. No, yeah, not just they, you. Therefore, you have no excuse. For on passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you practice the very same things. <laughs> Oof. Turn the knife. Uh, yeah. So as soon as they were ready to point the finger, say, yeah, yeah, those sinners, you know, I knew they were sinning. St. Paul says, oh boy, okay. Yeah, it's not just them. It is most certainly you. And that comes to kind of the famous verse of chapter three. All, okay, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So you see, get to Romans 3. Don't just stop at Romans 1. And don't linger on Romans 2. Get to Romans 3. And of course, the rest of Romans. But my point is, start and know that you're on the same level. And that you're called to be kind of on the same level. And that's how we have to approach these situations. Like God is fair in his justice, but he's fair in his justification and his forgiveness. Yes, all have fall, fallen short, but all are freely justified through his son. Absolutely crucial to remember when you're bearing these, these hard truths for people with people. All right, moving on to the final point. So God wants all to know him. Don't lose sight of that goal. God wants all to know him. Okay, so don't lose sight of that, including the person that you are dealing with, the person that's in your life. God wants them to know him. And that's kind of the big goal of all this because, and I'll just, I, I, I had to do this. Uh, so moving on, um, I have just a couple examples of how this is, kind of emphasized in the book of Ezekiel. If you click, like, all right, click. Uh, chapter five, thus shall my anger spend itself and they shall know that I am the Lord. Click again. Chapter six, and those of you who escape will remember me among the nations, how I've been broken over the whoring heart that has departed from me and you shall know that I am the Lord. I will punish you according to your ways. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I disperse them. My hand will be against the prophets who see false visions, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I will establish my cap, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. See in the pattern? Maybe. Uh, yes. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways. And I'll execute judgments upon Moab, then they will know that I am the Lord. Then all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord. And finally, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. So just a sampling of the big point and picture of what God is trying to do here. Not only for Israel, but looking at the ones from chapter 25 and 29 towards the bottom, even those other nations. What does God want? He wants them to know him, not only to know him as the one God, 
but to know them as kind of their their god that he could be their god now because here's the the big problem with israel israel is supposed to be kind of the light to the nations israel is supposed to be the people of god that everyone else could see and say, wow, these people are different, and they worship one God, and they are faithful, and they are loving, and they are so much different than everything else. I want to know their God. That was the whole point, really. God was going to work through Israel, use them as a witness to kind of draw other nations to himself. Now, was Israel even remotely good at that job? Not even remotely, no. Uh, they were just as bad. In fact, in chapter five, God says, you are even worse than all the other nations. You will find a new God every single day if you could. And you will carve an idol and you'll worship them and you will sacrifice your children and you will be cannibals. I mean, they were not, it was not as if they just like took a cookie from the cookie jar. They were terrible, just terrible and worse off in every way and all the other nations. So God's like, well, I'm supposed to use you to draw all people to myself. And all you're doing is pushing everybody away. And so God's like, okay, this is not good because not only is your life in me being compromised, but I want all of them to know me and you are getting in the way of that. And that's kind of the whole point of this exile was to wake them up to say, no, you know what? Not only are you just completely just undoing our relationship, but you're getting in the way of all nations and all peoples coming to know me through you. That's really not a small thing. That's why God responds the way he does. And then all this kind of brings me back to uh, John 17. We've been coming back to this one again and again. And it's kind of just so, so important, and, and it takes this whole idea of knowing God and, and brings it home. Now, this is eternal life, that they what? Know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then Jesus ends this whole chapter with a prayer. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order what? That the love you have for me may be in them that I myself may be in them. So this is the prayer for his disciples. But really, you and I can pray that prayer in a sense. Verses 25, 26. This is kind of what we are wanting. That, you know what? Maybe this person doesn't know you. It doesn't seem like they know you. But I know you. And they know that, that I know you. And I'm trying to make you known to them. And I will continue to try in order that the love they have for me is in that person. You see, we kind of follow in Jesus' footsteps with this. That the whole point, and here it is, the whole point of you bearing these hard truths, having these difficult conversations, these ongoing situations, the reason that you're called in them for however long you might be called to be in them, is that they know God. More than just even necessarily getting them to do everything right or to be, um, to be even all that different. I mean, there should be probably some, some life change and all of that. But the ultimate goal is that they know God. And again, that's, that's on God to change hearts, but, but you, can, you can be there. You can be that person in their life where they know that you know God. And you are called in all these weird situations, or you're, just, you're called to have these difficult things. And all the, all the while, the love of God that you have is shown to them. That's what this is all about. And so my encouragement to you guys, as you have these difficult conversations, just remember these things. 
Remember the difficult calling that Ezekiel had. Remember the difficult calling that Jesus had in trying to call sinners back to God. Remember that, okay, you are a sinner called back to God. And God has called you to bring others along. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are so merciful to us. And you call us to bear your word. So God, help us to do that faithfully. Help us to speak when we need to speak, um, to be silent when we need to stay silent. But ultimately, to trust you in the process. You call us to it and you have equipped us for it. So give us everything that we need so that they may know the love that you have for them, so that they may know you. So I pray for each of these guys in this room this morning. I pray that you would refresh them and encourage them and give them wisdom, give them the words to say when the moment comes and help them to, to bear your word to speak your truths to the people that need to hear them. We ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.